Hey there, and thanks for watching. Over the next few minutes, I'll be walking you through my simple acquisition model for office, retail, and industrial. Now, this is version 4.0 of the model. Quite a few major changes have been made to the model, and so it really necessitated a new walkthrough. Now, if you're familiar with this model, the changes really come in the property returns and partnership returns tabs. Both have, have seen a complete revamp. I've also deleted the data and debt tabs as they are largely redundant to information in other areas of the model. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Whether you're familiar with the model or not, let's let's start with the property summary tab. This is where, where you'll start. Again, you enter information into blue font cells. Uh, that's real estate financial modeling convention. Blue font meaning input cells, black font output cells. Green font are links to inputs and outputs on other worksheets. Uh, we enter our property name, city state, we enter also for visualization purposes, the percentage occupied. We then have the purchase price method. And, and this model is meant to allow you to, to do a straight acquisition. You enter a uh, asking price or a whisper price into the set purchase price cell here. And the model will assume that's your purchase price. However, it also has the ability, if you want to use this as a pricing tool or to size to a, a direct cap or DCF value, you can choose a DCF value. That's the present value discounted at this, count, this discount rate. And here you see then that the resulting purchase price is equal to that present value, 24.866 million. Or in other words, assuming there's no other costs at at uh, this purchase price, you would yield this unlevered IRR. Of course, if you look here, you see an unlevered IRR of 7.1, and you might say, well, that doesn't match my discount rate. That's because up front we have some CapEx, as well as due diligence and closing costs. If I zero both of those out, you'll find that the unlevered IRR matches the discount rate. Let me put those back in. You also have a cap year one NOI or direct cap value that simply takes your year one NOI divides it by what you assume is a market cap rate for year one. And that gives you then your purchase price, 24.5 million. Finally, there's the option to size to replacement cost. And that is this replacement cost input cell here, $400 per, in this case, square foot, gives us a value of 20 million based on 50,000 square feet. Now, the other thing to note in this left-hand column, and then let me put this back to manual, is exit valuation assumptions. So at, at the end of your analysis period, in this case, 10 years, and you can go up to a 15 year analysis period, uh, we'll have a sale or a revaluation of the property. We call that residual or reversion value. And at exit, then we have the option uh, because that value will be calculated automatically in this simple acquisition model to use either the forward looking 12 months of NOI or the trailing 12 months of NOI to calculate our terminal value. And now in terms of cap rate, you'll see it's a cap rate of 7% or terminal cap rate or exit cap rate out 10 years from now. And how that's calculated is we take our market cap rate today, an assumption that you'll enter, and we'll grow that exit cap rate growth per year by five basis points in this case, or we could say zero, or we could even shrink the cap rate over the whole period and that will change what our terminal value is. Uh, the only other things to note, again, you can enter an upfront CapEx. That assumes that the, those dollars or pesos or euros or what have you, th that amount of money is spent immediately. It, in fact, it's assumed it's spent in time zero, uh, as well as due diligence and closing costs as a percentage of your purchase price. Uh, also along this right-hand column, you have selling costs at exit. So while your value at exit is 29.105 million, you'll net that amount less some selling costs as a percentage of that amount. Now down here, we also have financing assumptions. So the loan amount is sized to a loan to value, and it assumes that value is equal to your purchase price. So you might also think of that as loan to cost. Uh, but loan to value, 65%. There's some lender fees that are also uh, baked in here. Uh, there's an interest rate on an annual basis. You have the option to model uh, some period of interest only, some amortization period, and then your loan term. 
And by default, the loan term will be equal to your analysis period. So with those financing assumptions, these property summary assumptions, we then move to our overly simple OS DCF. And this really is overly simple. So there's no rent roll. Uh, there's a basic recovery income or reimbursement income module. It really is meant to be a back of the envelope kind of first pass uh, on uh, more simple single tenant or, or just a few tenants, uh, most likely either gross lease or net lease. Um, and, and in here then you'll enter, first you might put historicals in, columns E and F, and that helps you then derive a pro forma or year one uh, NOI cash flow from operations. So you'd enter base rent, recovery income, and so forth. You're going to have a vacancy assumption. And so you'll assume that all of these items are grossed up or, or as if your building is fully occupied, you'll then assume some vacancy. And that vacancy can either be just a single value across the entire analysis period, or you can see down here, we can detail out our vacancy by year. Okay. So in addition to that, we have our operating expenses and then our CapEx. Now the CapEx is assumed you're going to manually model that throughout the hold when you have rollover and et cetera. Again, this is an overly simple DCF meant, meant to be for back of the envelope. If you need a more robust um, office retail industrial module that will, that will automatically calculate things like reimbursements and rollover, you, you might check out my all-in-one model. But for a quick pass, this is a really good and simple model. Uh, and then finally down here, we have the detailed vacancy and growth rate. So I already mentioned vacancy. You, ha you can detail out by year, income growth, OPEX growth, property tax growth, CAPEX growth. So for instance, imagine you have a single tenant and the tenant has uh, a 10% a bump in year five and a 10% bump in year 10. What we do is just zero these out. And then we go, okay, well, we're going to bump starting in year six, 10%. Starting year 10, 10%. And as we come up, you'll see rent is flat. And then at the end of year five, it bumps such that starting in year six, you get that 10% increase. And then likewise, hitting in year 10, it actually would be year 11, right? Because at the end of year 10, end of year 10, it bumps. Year 11 now has that new bump. And that bump, by the way, is now included in our reversion value. So you see that as we re we head over to the property returns tab. Now here, this is a reports tab. You'll see that there are no blue font cells on this tab. And this is where you can see the outputs from the assumptions you're making on the property summary and the OS DCF tab. Now, this tab, this module, if you will, has been completely rebuilt from ver the previous version 3.1. And what I've done here is I now follow more strictly the methodology that we teach in our accelerator, namely the anatomy of the real estate DCF, investment cash flow section, operating cash flow section, reversion cash flow section, as well as uh, the results of those three sections of your real estate DCF uh, resulting in unlevered cash flow and returns or before debt and a levered cash flow and return section after debt. Uh, below at the very bottom, you'll see that there is a IRR matrix. And so while we're calculating unlevered IRR and levered IRR based on whatever analysis period that was chosen in the property summary tab, you can also see an estimate of the IRR by year. So if you're looking for a way to size or, or to, to forecast, uh, which year would be the optimal year to exit, this tool is helpful in doing that type of analysis. The other thing you'll note, the debt service payments, as well as the loan payoff are calculated now just on this property returns tab. Before they were uh, calculated separately on the debt tab and brought over here and it seemed overly redundant. And so I've deleted that tab altogether. Uh, finally, the partnership returns tab completely rebuilt. I now use my equity waterfall model, which has either IRR hurdles, equity multiple hurdles, or the option to choose the greater of IRR or equity multiple. And you choose that here under promote hurdle method. You can use IRR equity multiple or IRR plus equity multiple. So let's go back to IRR. You set what percentage will be contributed by the GP and the balance being contributed by the LP. You set 
uh, your distribution percentage uh, during the the first tier, which is the pref and the return of capital, and then whatever promote uh, both uh, IRR or if you use equity multiple hurdles, um, whatever hurdle as well as the promote that would be paid to the GP, and then it calculates the distribution percentage to the GP and LP. And then this model again assumes that the partnership uh, is promoted or the partnership pays the promote to the GP. Um, and then down here, if you need to add in uh, partnership level fees, asset management fees, acquisition or disposition fees, you enter those here and those are then rolled into the GP fees line here. And you can see then the LPIRR, the GPIRR, LP equity multiple, GP equity multiple, and so forth. And so with that, uh, I've shared with you the latest update to my simple real estate acquisition model for office retail and industrial. Let me know if you have any questions about any changes that you see here in version 4.0 and uh, otherwise, thanks for your time.